Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service uh, for Orville Mennonite Church Community this morning. Uh, we have uh, we have ten ish people in attendance personally. Uh, you can see most of them on your screen, although there's a couple of high schoolers hiding in the youth room in the back. Uh, and uh, and we're, we're it's, actually it's really nice to see people. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. Uh, and we have a number of people joining us on Zoom. And as we have as we have uh, proclaimed in faith before, uh, we continue to proclaim today. God is not inhibited uh, by our uh, by our issues today. Uh, God is capable of receiving our worship, even though we're not all physically in the same place, and even though some of our audios are sketchy or or other issues we're having. Uh, worship is a matter of us uh, joining together in our hearts and souls. Uh, yes, our experience is diminished personally, but uh, we can fully worship God. And so we trust that this morning, and we just trust that we are worshiping God together, uh, no matter how that is happening. And uh, so we're happy to be doing that. Uh, this morning we will begin, uh, as we have been, with the uh, lighting of our lamps. And Allison, who is at home probably on our patio, will lead us in that effort. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. We light one lamp because we are part of a larger Christian family, our Mennonite church working together for peace. We light one lamp because we walk with our brothers and sisters of Upanga Mennonite church in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. We light one lamp because we stand with our sisters and brothers who are immigrants among us. We light one lamp because we are part of a greater humanity under threat of a virus, praying for wisdom and health. We light one lamp to lament ongoing racial injustice in our country and world. Today we ask God for strength and willingness to have conversations that are difficult and uncomfortable. Merciful God, help us to hear your messengers, your prophets who ask us to repent and to live the way of your salvation. Give us grace to heed their warnings, forsake our sins, and walk in your ways. Help us to trust you so we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns in you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. We're going to sing uh, two songs from the Green Book, Sing the Journey, uh, numbers 80 and 81. Uh, Christ be near at either hand. I sang this on one of the devotionals a few weeks ago. Uh, and uh, uh, I just, you know, one of the, I guess one of the joys for me in all of this and doing those, uh, those daily video devotions is I've been learning a lot of songs in our songbooks. Uh, and some of them are really quite good. Uh, and this is one, I don't really know why, I think the melody is a little strange, but uh, for whatever reason, this song has just worked its way into my heart. Christ be near at either hand. Uh, Anita's going to play it once through because it's uh, new for us as a congregation, and then we'll sing the three verses. Control my wayward heart. 
Christ abide and ne'er depart. Christ my life and only way, Christ my lantern night and day, Christ be my unchanging friend, guide and shepherd. This next song uh, is Take, O oh, Take Me As I Am. We're going to sing it three times. Uh, and it is, a, it is a prayer, really, for us. And I think it's a, it's a good prayer for us to sing before we hear Scripture and, uh, and, and see what we can learn from Scripture. Take, O oh, Take Me As I Am. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. And now let's hear uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, 1 to 12. Diane Hostetler will read that for us. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus. In order to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he replied, At evening you say, It will be nice weather because the sky is bright red. And in the morning you say, There will be bad weather today because the sky is cloudy. You know how to make sense of the sky's appearance, but you are unable to recognize the signs that point to what time it is. An evil and unfaithful generation searches for a sign but they won't receive any sign except Jonah's sign. And he left them and went away. When the disciples arrived on the other side of the lake, they had forgotten to bring bread. Jesus said to them, watch out and be on your guard for the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, we didn't bring any bread. Jesus knew what they were discussing and said, you people of weak faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you don't have any bread? Don't you understand yet? Don't you remember the five loaves that fed the 5,000 and how many baskets of leftovers you gathered? And the seven loaves that fed the 4,000 and how many large baskets of leftovers you gathered? Don't you know that I was, wasn't talking about bread? But be on your guard for the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he wasn't telling them to be on their guard for the yeast used in making bread. No, he was telling them to watch out for the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. This morning we're going to talk about cluelessness. Um, humans are really good at that, uh, both talking about it and being. Uh, uh, we're good at missing the boat or the bus for those who don't swim. We're, we're pretty good at being obtuse or ignorant or oblivious or bollocksed uh, or lost. There are lots of reasons uh, for being clueless. 
Uh, sometimes, sometimes we're clueless just because we haven't learned anything about what we're facing yet, right? That's where uh, every leader of every sort was at the beginning of the pandemic and really still are uh, at every new decision-making point. No worries there, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, we just don't know, right? Uh, sometimes we're clueless because we're in over our head. Uh, some things are just really difficult to understand and maybe be, may be above, like speaking, for example, our mental capacity. For example, I'm clueless about how a computer processor actually works. I can get a broad strokes understanding, but the details are way above my head. Again, I, you know, for these first two ways of, of missing the boat or being clueless, uh, there's no reason to feel any guilt or self-doubt. This is just a, a matter of keeping on learning or just recognizing, you know, some things I'm just not going to understand. Now, sometimes we're clueless because we're not paying attention. Allison and I will drive in a car together uh, with the radio on the news and, you know, I'll be driving and staring out the window and she'll make a comment on or ask a question about what was said on the news and more than likely I'm going to say, what? Oh, sorry, I wasn't pay paying attention. Uh, sometimes we're clueless because we're so settled in what we think we know that we have a self-imposed block against any other way of doing or thinking about anything. The classic and really pretty benign example of this is a kid asking her parent for something certain that the answer will be no. Mom, can I have the car tonight? Sure, honey, be back by 10. I know you aren't sure I, I can handle it, but I can, I really can. Sure, honey, please, mom, really, I can handle it. I promise I'll go the speed limit. Sure, honey. Oh, come on, mom, please. Surely you aren't listening. I said yes. There are certainly variations of this last one that aren't so benign, right? Uh, isn't uh, at some level, racism is at least partly a kind of cluelessness. It's a self-imposed block against seeing the humanity and value in, in people of color. Uh, in the world of theology, we can be so settled in one way of approaching a passage or a situation that we block ourselves from the possibility that there could be a better way to approach it. Or maybe the w whatever way that we were raised to do whatever a certain way, uh, you know, we just put a block against... Uh, you know, against thinking another thing. It's, it's probably why there are, there are John Deere people and there are Massey Ferguson people in there, right? Like those are probably more about, or Ford or Chevy or whatever, those are probably more about how we were raised. And then we just put these self-imposed blocks than on evaluation of the machinery themselves. Again, all those are benign, right? It doesn't really matter if you like John, John Deere or Ford or Massey Ferguson or whatever the other ones are. I'm not a farmer or Ford or Chevy. Who cares? Uh, I, I say those of you who really care will hurt me about that, and it's fine. But uh, the fact of the matter is we're, as humans, we're really good at cluelessness. Uh, and today's passage gives us some good examples of, of how that happens. Not all the examples, but some. Uh, there are three groups of people in our in our passage today, and they expose uh, their their cluelessness is exposed. And what I want to do is I want us to look at that, and then and then start looking at ourselves. What sorts of what sorts of uh, cluelessness do we have that prevents us or puts blocks against us seeing what God is doing among us? And so that's, the, that's ultimately the question for us for today. Now, the three groups of people uh, in this passage are the Pharisees and Sadducees. So those are two groups, but they're acting in this passage as one, even though they're very different. They have very different ideologies. Uh, and the third group is the disciples. And so if you, uh, for anyone who's been around the Bible a little bit uh, or a lot of bit, uh, or, and maybe even have a study Bible there, most study Bibles will list out uh, somewhere on a page in the gospels. Uh, they'll have you know four basic groups within Judaism at the time of Jesus that were really a mix of religious and political parties because those lines weren't, weren't separated. They, what they really wanted was to be a theocracy where there was no, like we just have one ruler and that's God. And, through right so we so they don't have that idea of separation of religion and state um, 
that we that we that we at least claim to have right uh, those, so those four groups all have different philosophies they all have some kind of influence and the influence varies depending on the time uh, and you know who the leaders are right so just just like for us you know any groups influence will depend on how well they're doing or what what's happening in the culture and how it relates to who they are and so those four groups are Pharisees and Sadducees the Essenes and maybe zealots uh, but there were more. There were scribes, sometimes known as teachers of the law or legal experts. Uh, so all of those were, uh, you know, scribes were people who could read and write. Uh, but often those were also the teachers of the law or the legal experts. Uh, so clergy, right? That's how I've been equating these folks to clergy, uh, folks who are expert in, in the teachings of Scripture and how to interpret them for life. Right. So there were also rabbis who could have been some of those, uh, uh, but they're probably spread throughout all of those groups. So rabbis, you know, somewhat akin to pastors. Um, there were priests. So those were the those were the people who led in the in the in the ritual acts of worship at the temple uh, or way back in tabernacle times in the in the tabernacle. The Essenes were a group. Uh, were a group uh, out in the desert who were kind of a separatist group, and they they seemed to be started by priests who uh, grew uncomfortable with how the priestly group was interpreting things and acting, and so they separated out uh, and they went to the desert. Um, and they were like many separatist groups; they were ultra conservative and very kind of limited. Uh, the, if the zealots were their own group, and there's some question about that, uh, the alternative would be there were zealots in each of these groups, right? And so that zealousy, meaning they really wanted to overthrow Rome in a physical way as soon as possible. Um, if they were their own group, uh, they wanted they wanted to over overthrow Rome, right? So there was a whole other group, and that was the Samaritans. The Samaritans were Jews. Uh, it seems like the Samaritans claimed to be descendants of the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. Uh, but they may have also been the descendants of the Babylonians who settled uh, their area uh, after the exile. Uh, most likely, uh, they were a mix of that. They were the descendants of, of ancient Israel, the northern tribes, and maybe specifically those two tribes. And uh, during the exile, not every single person was take, taken away. Uh, so when, when Babylon sent uh, people to settle, or Assyria sent people to settle, uh, uh, th those people ended up over generations intermixing, right? Uh, but the, the Samaritans were Jews. They held to the Torah, the first five books of Scripture, Genesis, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, they were, uh, they worshiped, they expected the Messiah. Uh, they had sharp disagreements on where the temple should be and a little bit on how to worship. And sometimes the regular Jews, what we would think of as, as maybe the Jerusalem Jews uh, and the Samaritans had sharp disagreements that were strong enough to be violent. Um, so, so they're a whole nother group, and by and large, the thread of the New Testament telling of the story puts the Samaritans on the outside, uh, except when Jesus talks. Uh, you know, he, he talked to the woman at the well that was in Samaria, right? And he tells the story of the good Samaritan, right? So Jesus is trying to <laughs> bridge the stuff together. Uh, but uh, another group was the Sanhedrin. Now, this was the ruling council, or really probably more like a system of courts. There were, uh, according to a Catholic site I looked at, uh, just to learn a little bit more about this, uh, seemed to be, you know, two... Um, two levels of this court, kind of lower courts and, and Supreme Court. When we see Sanhedrin in the New Testament, more than likely they're talking about what would, akin, would be more akin to our Supreme Court. These were the kind of the ultimate judges uh, for whatever disputes or challenges were being tossed around, and they would have been based in Jerusalem. Uh, because that was the center of, of the non-Samaritan version of Jewish 
of Jewish faith. So this is a complicated mess of affiliations, right? Like there's no test on this, so it's okay. Uh, uh, each had their own establishment, their own way of doing things, interpreting things. They had their own slice of the power pie. They had their own expectations regarding people and religion. And uh, their power kind of came and went depending on what was happening at the time. The Pharisees, we'll look in a little more at them, uh, we're, a, we're a pretty tiny group of people uh, that the, the Catholic source I mentioned uh, from St. Mary's Press uh, says that maybe 6,000 out of a million Jews were Pharisees. That's not a huge amount, right? But their influence on life and faith was huge. Uh, even more huge after Jesus' resurrection and after the destruction of the temple, which was uh, about year 70, uh, um, but, but also in the time of Jesus. The Pharisees, like us, they believed in lived faith. They held, uh, they held as scripture most of what we call the Old Testament, about, about two-thirds of it, I think. Uh, they believed in a coming Messiah. They believed in resurrection. In addition to scripture, though, they followed the traditions of the elders, uh, called the oral law, because these were traditions passed down. They were interpretations of rules, and 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 they were sort of refined rules. Uh, so the Old Testament says, "Don't steal," and and the Old Testament, uh, you know, the Torah uh, specifies a little bit on that, but the oral the oral tradition uh, specified that even more. How does that apply here? How does that apply here? How does that apply here? Two words you may have heard Mishnah and Talmud uh, are names of two of the written collections of books containing the oral law. They were written later. Uh, uh, they were written down la later and there are at least three collections of them. Uh, the two names that I suppose some of us may have heard before the Mishnah and Tal Talmud are, are two of those. So, and it appears to me in the, in the story, the way Matthew is telling it, that, that many of the arguments Jesus has with the Pharisees particularly are based around these traditions, not scripture. Uh, the Sadducees, our other player today, were more conservative. Uh, like the Essenes, they accepted only the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. They rejected the oral law. Uh, the traditions that were passed down by the elders. Uh, and so these traditions, you know, like for us, you know, in North America, you know, we could, we could see traditions passed down over what, 200 years, right? For them, we're talking a thousand years, 1500 years, like there's long traditions of generations uh, pa passed down. Uh, so they did not follow the oral law. Uh, and uh, and they they typically were told didn't didn't believe in the resurrection. I don't suppose that any of these groups, every single person, held fastly to all of the generalizations I'm giving. Right, like any group, certainly there were variations. Uh, so those are two of the groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, they would typically be kind of opposed to each other, recognizing that they're all Jews, uh, but just kind of telling each other that they're going about it wrong. Right. Uh, yeah, but they have some agreement uh, in, uh, in that they both believe that Jesus is not uh, helping their causes. He's not stepping into their traditions. He's not honoring their power structures. He's not coming into their establishments. And so in this passage, they're working together, uh, which is at least a little bit interesting. So the third player in this is, are the disciples. Uh, disciples are those who followed Jesus. Still, still the case, right? The word means learner. Uh, and in this passage, most likely, we are referring to the 12, that inner circle of people that Jesus specifically chose uh, and is kind of given the, you know, given the, the boot camp course of how to do what he's doing. Right. So the, the disciples didn't just sit at Jesus feet and to watch and learn. Uh, we can probably think of the 12 as interns. They, in addition to watching Jesus and kind of and practicing some even, right? Uh, they also they organize what needed to be organized. They, when food was needed, when shelter, when travel arrangements, whatever, with that was even a thing. Uh, you know, they did the background work so that Jesus uh, could keep on teaching and healing. They were they were really kind of akin to our modern sense of being an intern. And as they were doing those, these things, they were observing Jesus healing and casting out demons and how he treated people and, uh, you know, how he taught and showed compassion. They were learning and, and sometimes they got to practice. 
So now let's let's back up into the passage and look at how these groups were clueless uh, regarding who Jesus is. And today's passage starts with the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to Jesus. Listen, give us a sign. We want a sign so that we know who you are. And this is the second time in Matthew we see this. The first, uh, and it's really almost a direct quote uh, from Matthew 12, 38. Uh, and Jesus answer is the same well he he uh, uh, there's a there's a, a little something he tells first but but then he basically says that you are an, un, an evil and unfaithful generation and you're not going to have a sign the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah which is to say resurrection uh, you know Jonah was in the belly of the sea creature the whale the fish whatever it was uh, for three days and then he was spat out onto the land uh, so that's sort of a archetyped right for resurrection right and uh, and so so the sign that they're gonna get is gonna come later is what Jesus is saying you'll you'll recognize who I am when I come back to life right now uh, that's that's what he is saying in code really by saying the sign of Jonah uh, but rather than that and that's how it goes in chapter 12 uh, as Matthew reports the conversation then which was with the Pharisees and the clergy um, but this time Jesus gives an example. He points out their cluelessness a little, a little more solidly. He says, you know how to read the weather signs, right? Uh, you know, when it's a red sky and, or when it's a blue, you know, you know, all that stuff. He says, you know how to, you know how to look at the sky and say, well, probably rain's coming or probably a storm's coming or probably it's going to be nice. And yet somehow you, uh, implied leaders of the faith have no idea who you're looking at. Why don't you understand what time this is? Why don't you understand what is happening? Why can't you read the current signs? So, you know, he points that out. So, so, uh, so that's, that's the question, right? Why is it that they are clueless about this? It's not because they're not smart or they haven't learned enough. These are the people coming to him would be leaders of these groups. They would very likely, again, we don't know every individual, right? But they very likely would be very learned. They would have broad understanding of scripture, at least the Torah in the case of the Sadducees, uh, and certainly more broadly for the Pharisees. Uh, but uh, they're, they're plenty smart and learned enough the problem is their own ideas and power structures are in the way. They are looking at Jesus not to learn what God is doing. They're looking at Jesus to protect their place in the establishment, to protect their influence, to protect their way of doing things. Uh, so much so that the, the two groups who are not friendly are working together. Uh, they know how things should go. They know they don't agree with each other, Sadducees, Pharisees, about that. But they agree that Jesus is not supporting either of their power structures or their certainties. Their selfishness and their sin stops them from being able to understand what God is doing and who Jesus is, really. So then this is the question for us. When does our sin inhibit us from seeing what God is doing? When does our certainty, our sureness, I know this is the thing, prevent us from seeing what God is doing? When does our unwillingness to change prevent us from seeing what God is doing or who Jesus is? When does our state of power and influence or our, our desire to protect that power or influence or privilege stop us from seeing what God is doing? Next up are the disciples. The, the disciples, in this sense, the 12, they're, they're thinking that they're hungry and they're embarrassed that they neglected to bring some bread along, right? Uh, he, uh, so this is verse, uh, verse 5. When the disciples arrived on the other side of the lake, they had uh, forgotten to bring bread. And Jesus said to them, watch out and be on your guard for the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so they discussed this among themselves and said, we didn't, we didn't bring any bread. Uh, so the thing about yeast, right, is uh, Jews had sort of a love-hate relationship with yeast. It was fine in bread most of the year, 
but uh, yeast was also sometimes a symbol for evil. Uh, and during the Passover, they were told not to have yeast. And, and so they actually, they needed to go and rid their house of the yeast. And so, so sometimes yeast was a, oh, be on guard for a actual yeast. And so the disciples were so keyed on probably they were hungry, but certainly they were embarrassed because they didn't bring bread uh, with them. And, and so they didn't, they basically weren't paying attention. They didn't hear what Jesus was saying. They didn't, the, by now they've been following Jesus around long enough that they know sometimes they need to think extra hard when he talks. And this isn't the first time he's spoken. Uh, and, and so they're, they're clueless and they miss what Jesus is saying because they're preoccupied with their own mistake and aren't really paying attention. They're thinking about themselves and their performance and not paying attention to Jesus. So does this ever happen to you? Does it ever happen that you're so focused on your performance of whatever you're doing that you're not paying attention to what God is doing or who Jesus is or what God is trying to say? For the disciples, rather than calling them evil and unfaithful, well, he calls them unfaithful, uh, but he chastises them and he corrects them. Now they get it. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are dangerous. Well, their teaching is dangerous. And there's also a, okay, we are not, whatever we are, whatever we followers of Jesus are, whatever this, whatever this new thing is going to be, it's not going to be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Right, that's part of the message here. This is like whatever whatever Jesus is leading us toward, has been leading us toward, it is not what the Pharisees and Sadducees have been teaching. He's warning us about their cheap teaching. So really one more example of the clashing establishments Matthew highlights as he tells Jesus' story. So again, the, the focus now is, okay, so, um, we could dig in more and learn more about the Pharisees and Sadducees and the disciples and, and all of those inner workings. But, but I think for our takeaway, we need to, we need to take a look inside. Uh, what are, what are, what status or situation in our lives or sins or strong opinions or affiliations and or certainties, and they're probably all those overlap some, right? Uh, that we hold so closely that we have a self-erected block in seeing what God is doing in our lives or in the lives of others around us. I would invite conversation uh, in Sunday schools if you want, as you're talking about other things that you're talking about, take a look at, so if you're, if you're wrestling with whatever, so am I self-imposing a block? And if it's just, I don't understand, no problem, don't feel any guilt about that, but try and understand. Talk about things that might keep you from seeing clearly in your life. And, and then as we think about being community, uh, as we practice being Jesus community together, how might we encourage each other to let go enough to be able to see? My guess is that judging each other and chastising each other harshly is probably not the way to do that. Uh, but how can we encourage each other to let go to be able to see? Let's pray and then we'll sing again. God, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for your patience with us. We're grateful for your mercy and compassion. We're grateful for your truth and for your holiness and for your demands. Uh, and we ask, uh, we ask for your forgiveness. Uh, certainly each one of us and certainly we as a community have missed what you're doing. Uh, and certainly each one of us owns a piece of that, whether how, however right we think we are, uh, including me. Uh, help us to learn to encourage each other uh, so that together we can, while well, we can walk together, grow closer to you, sharing your love, learning together. Uh, help, us, uh, help us as we seek to, uh, to drop the blockades we've erected around us. Uh, help us to approach your truth with open hands and open hearts and open eyes. We trust you for all of this, God, and we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so we're going to sing two songs. I don't remember the order. 
Yeah, so this song, as I went down to the river to pray, it's number 79 in the Sing the Journey, the Green Book. Um, I don't really know why. I think the first, when the pandemic started and we, and uh, somewhere in March when I started doing the daily video sermons, I think this was one of the first ones, the first songs that I sang. And, and I don't know why, but this song has been on my heart the whole time. Uh, I don't really understand uh, other than what it calls us to do, right? It calls us to, <laughs> it calls us to come to the river, right? To <laughs> God, what's going on? How can we help us, please, right? So let's uh, let's sing this together. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down, come on, brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe, sorry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, fathers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, fathers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way and who shall wear the robe and crown good lord show me the way oh mothers let's go down come on down don't you wanna go down come on mothers let's go down down to the river to as I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Now let's sing Build Your Kingdom Here. That's uh, on page 14 of the little white book for those of you who are here or have those at home, and it'll be on your screen. Oh, wait, where's the egg? I'm gonna try and play the egg. All right, ready? One, two, three. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made 
come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls holy spirit come invade us now we are your church we need your power in us seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captives hearts released the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause we are your church we pray revive this earth Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. Reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop your beauty changing heart. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are the church. We are the hope on earth build your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on fire win this nation back Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Amen. Let's pray the love step prayer together. Lord, open my eyes to see when you put me in front of someone, then help me to meet them with love where they are. Help us to walk together, learn from each other, and share your love with others, that we may grow closer to Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace and give you peace, and give you peace forever.